And are you going to stay in town or are you going to head back afterwards? I'm staying in town tonight. Oh, staying cool. in town. I got awesome. a buddy that lives up here, um, mm-hmm. Cody. He's been on the podcast several times. Cool. And um, yeah, so I'll be staying with him uh, tonight and nice. heading back in the morning. Nice. There's a good uh, brewery here on site, so you should go check it out if you want yeah, to the time. Yeah, what's it St. Elmo. St. Elmo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's good. It's uh, They've been around about a year or so. And um, yeah, it's just, it's a good joint. Great, great beer there. Awesome, man. Yeah, yeah, I actually did a podcast at St. Arnold's Brewery in oh, Houston, yeah. in Houston uh, yeah. last week. Cool. So that was a lot of fun. Awesome. We're on. We're on. We're rock and rolling. Sweet man. So uh, yeah, let's let's get it going. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with Jay. Uh, how you say your last name, Jay? Uh, Salcedo. Salcedo. Um, and I actually go by JB. A lot of people call me Jay because that's uh, just the way it's like spelled. People uh, call me that. But my my real name is uh, Juan Bernard Salcedo. Um, but growing up, my uncle uh, Chato from South Texas would refer to me as just JB. And so it just kind of stuck. And then when I was in high school, um, my uh, girlfriend at the time um, was just kind of joking around with me about how to spell it for some like uh, marketing stuff that I was making, like some business cards and things like that. And so we started spelling it J-A-Y dash B, like mm-hmm. Jay-Z. Mm-hmm. And uh, eventually I dropped the hyphen, just started going by J and JB and that kind of thing. So, yeah. JB, will rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> so you started this thing a long time with the entrepreneurial uh, yeah. kind of adventure in high school. You're talking about making business cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, um, so my first business was, uh, I power washed people's driveways. My wow. dad bought one of those little, uh, you know, like 2000 PSI power washers. And I went around my neighborhood in Laporte where I grew up and, uh, would power wash people's driveways for 30 bucks. So mm-hmm. now I look back and I'm like, man, I was charging way too little money for it. But, yeah. uh, but yeah, that's how I'd go buy PlayStation games or whatever it is that my parents, you know, didn't want to buy me. I'd go buy it that way. But, uh, did that. And then, uh, in high school I shot a lot of videos and did, um, like photography and stuff. Um, but, uh, but yeah, then I came up here to go to UT and went to school for four years and, uh, and then ended up in the creative world and kind of worked in, in advertising for a long time. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome, man. Um, fun little coincidence there. My stepson spent the entire summer power washing people's driveways and oh, houses really? with yeah. a pressure washing machine yeah yeah uh, a friend of ours had the whole he had a whole trailer set up and was looking for a young guy yeah with a truck pulled the trailer around stir up some business so that's what he spent the summer doing was, yeah it's uh, dirty work but yeah. you know it's like i don't know there's something kind of uh a little bit relaxing about like what literally just like watching you Absolutely, like scrape man. off this you know yeah. junk off the ground or whatever so anyway exactly mesmerizing cool. videos that's what i told yeah. him i was like take yeah. some cool videos i was like i'll start up your business on facebook and stuff yeah for sure cool so um you are the founder ceo of, of texas humor dot com right Correct. so i did it start out as um uh, kind of you know apparel company or was it just something no, I mean, no, basically we, um, so I have a friend who owns, uh, this other Twitter account that's got several million followers. And back in 2011, uh, you know, I, I got on Twitter, I don't know, in 2007 or 2008 or something yeah. like that. I mean, but at that point, Twitter really was just people getting on there and kind of talking to one another. It wasn't really, no one was creating content specifically for that feed. Yeah. And so around 2011, a friend of mine um, went to this conference up in somewhere in the Midwest uh, called RaffleCon. Um, and it was about like sort of how, you know, like the I can has cheeseburger website was making money and with advertising and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, they were up there and they had heard about how like Twitter was now being used to kind of like generate content that was like specifically written for Twitter. Mm, yep. So th- he came back and, and took that idea, started an account, blew it up really quickly because, you know, the thing is like Twitter, when, when it was first really developing in the first handful of years, it didn't have a good tool for telling you like who you should follow and shouldn't follow. If your friends weren't really on there, then you didn't know you you were just like looking for something to follow. So in the first year when we founded it in December of 2011, I started Texas humor just kind of as a joke. Um, like, Oh, I'll see if I can write enough stuff. And I mean, I was picking up like several thousand followers a day. Yeah. And so, I mean, we got to 30,000 followers in like a handful of days, you know? And so, um, but at that point, pretty much everybody that was signing up for Twitter, which, you know, kind of hit a fever pitch. A lot of people were joining it. Um, 
they didn't know what to follow. So they followed whatever was being retweeted into their account mm-hmm. and into their feed. And so um, people were kind of out replying us or, you know, retweeting what we were saying and stuff. And so that was really how we got a lot of the, the followers. But initially the way that it, it began as a business was that we were posting stuff on there and then we would share like content on, you know, our website and some other stuff. And we would just have advertising dollars on there. Um, but long term, we decided that we wanted to like do something else. We didn't know really what. But a friend of mine, uh, who now is a friend of mine, back in the day, uh, it was a sales guy at a, a t-shirt company, and he said, "Hey, um, I work at River City Sportswear, which is you know here in Austin." And um, you know, he said, "Hey, I think that you guys have a real opportunity to sell some product. Do you guys have any designs or anything like that that you could sell?" And uh, he said, one of our clients, uh, Rowdy Gentleman, um, they sell products and they've got a big Twitter account and blah, blah, blah. So he kind of told me how it worked. And I had come up with this Ain't Texas design a long time ago. And I drew that out and like posted it on our account and people just went crazy for it. So I turned around and put it on a website and kind of started from there. And that was about five years ago. Actually, November 11th, 2013 was when the T-shirt part of it started. Yeah. Um, But that wasn't, that was two years after we started the Twitter account. Yeah, that's crazy. So that was up my suspicion the whole time. I think I'm one of your, probably 2012, Mm -hmm. if I had to put a number on it. 2012 is when I started following y'all on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um, I had gotten off Facebook and I wasn't on Instagram or anything. Twitter was the only thing I was on. That's where I got my news and sports information, all that stuff. Yeah. And I followed you guys, and I was, you know, the the memes and the you yeah. know all the all the stuff you're writing was great, and um, was actually one of the main inspirations to start this to podcast, this. Awesome. the Lone Star Podcast, right? And um, but then I start, I saw the Ain't Texas design, um, saw the T-shirts start coming out, and the stickers and all that stuff. Actually, bought my wife and um, stepdaughters all shirts mm-hmm. and and stuff like that for cool. them to wear. Um, and just got, you know, it was like a cool thing. That's what I was looking for, you know, as a, you know, Texas yeah. know, flavored stuff and and um, local stuff. And so I, I ate it up for sure. But I wasn't sure if it was all part of the, the plan or no, if it just started no. kind of organically, which sounds like it did. No, I mean, at that point, I was still a photographer full time. So yeah. I mean, that's what I did for about 10 years was that I... Uh, I shot, I used to shoot advertising campaigns for Yeti and, you know, mm-hmm. uh, done work for them. I've done work for Texas Monthly, for Wired Magazine, like, you know, Chevrolet, like just various brands over the years. Yeah. And uh, that was my primary business. But, you know, the their, that industry, the, the sort of commercial photography uh, at the advertising level is a, um, there are, there are, relatively speaking, a small number of people doing all that work. Yeah. And so, um, and there's also a relatively speaking small number of jobs a year, you know, I mean, there's thousands and thousands of them, but still for all the work that's being done, um, you know, it's a small group of people who are all kind of bidding on that same stuff. And so, uh, so that's one component of just like, you know, you're always bidding against all these other photographers who are also creative and whatever, um, where I just felt like at some point I'd like a business that is not heavily reliant on me, you know, something that's a little bit more passive. Yeah. And, uh, and then on top of that, um, in that industry, there are seasonalities to when budgets are being spent to do these various ad projects and around Christmas time, like you've kind of done, like as an advertising agency, you've probably done most of your work already for the year. Yeah. And now it's, you're going to put those ads out there and just like kind of help convince people to buy your stuff. And so January and December or December and January, um, are sort of some slow months of the year. And, uh, that was why I just, you know, in December was like, Oh, you know what? I'm gonna start this Twitter account and just kind of joke around and mess around with it. And, uh, yeah, and it took off. So, you know, from the outset, no, there was no, it it was me being bored and just having something, some extra time and around Christmas to do something. Um, once we got bigger and we realized like we have something on our hands, we decided let's figure out how to do something with this. But it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I really even stopped being a photographer. You know, I, I, uh, our business was much smaller so I could kind of have it on the side and I could still shoot, but about two and a half, three years ago is when I stopped. Like I didn't, I don't take any more commissions or anything like that. Cool deal. So yeah. as far as the, the, uh, so do you consider yourself a retail company now? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so is that kind of the label? So, yeah. So the, the, the company itself is called, um, Salceda Industries. And basically what we do is, you know, we sell our shirts and, um, we sell the various products that we, you know, my book or the t-shirts that we design, John, our designer out there de- develops a lot of that stuff. And, um, 
you know, we sell those to our customers. But on the backside, what's really cool is that, you know, as we were trying to grow that business, we had to figure out how to scale it and ship a lot of stuff. You know, yeah. the first Christmas that took off, it was my wife and I in the garage every day, like folding T-shirts and putting them in the back of my truck and driving them to the post office. And so eventually, you know, we saw that there were other people with that same problem where they were trying to do the fulfillment and get it out the door. Um, so we started offering that as a service to other companies. So we actually do the shipping and logistics for about 30 some odd other brands. Wow. So Haller Brothers, mm -hmm. uh, Tecovis Boots, mm -hmm. um, Kamek, um, Rowdy Gentleman, uh, Austin City Limits, the TV show, and uh, a series of others. Uh, William Murray Golf, which was a spinoff brand from the Chivery. Um, we, we warehouse all their products. And when you buy something from their store, it's actually coming from us. Wow. So, um, so we're facilitating those orders going out the door alongside with Texas Humor. So was that 2013 that you started... The, the the online store for Texas Humor started 2013. Yeah. Uh, when did you the start? The fulfillment business yeah. is really only about three years old. Okay. So we were doing the first year or the first like couple months. We we're at our garage in our South Austin, and then you know in January of 2014 we moved our like all the shirts and everything to my office downtown, which I had, you know had on the east side. And uh, I used to be part of this studio called Public School, and we um, so I moved it into the basement of that facility, and then. Um, I ran it there until about August of that year of 2014. And then um, in August of that year, I got a warehouse here on property where we are. And um, that was about 3,200 square feet. And we were there for about two years. And then within the last two years, um, or a year and a half or so, we've expanded. And we, you know, then we had about 18,000 square feet between the Texas Humor stuff, Howler, and Tecovis Boots, and whatever. Yeah. Uh, we actually just moved in uh, the last three months to about 44,000 square feet of space over here, just right around the corner. Um, the Texas Humor HQ is here where we're sitting. Um, but like all of our facilities for our storage and stuff is over, just like. Crow's flight. I mean, you could throw a rock at it yeah. and hit it. So yeah, yeah. Well, there's definitely a lot of space around this around this joint. I, I noticed yeah. that driving around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There are, there's a lot of warehouse space. It wasn't as nice as it is now. Uh, back when we first moved here, it was mm -hmm. cheap, uh, much cheaper um, than we're paying currently. But uh, but it's it's really nice. I mean, we've got Spokesman Coffee right here. Mm -hmm. We've got St. Elmo in the back, you know, for uh, beer and stuff. And so and there's a, there's a taco truck the, down the road. Yeah, or there's like truck. so much stuff to tacos. do here. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. nice. You don't ever have to really leave. Yeah, so, and we live like you know, a mile from here, if even that, I think it's probably like a half mile from here. Yeah. So perfect, man. Yeah. Perfect. It's good. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Um, so what's the, what's the goal? I mean, you're constantly expanding sounds like, I mean, what, yeah. I mean, you know, our, our thing is that I think what's so beautiful about this country is that it doesn't matter, you know, there are so many opportunities to grow and I've always felt like, you know, I've always felt like luck is kind of a, a silly thing. Like, l yes, things happen randomly to people. Um, but more often than not, it's recognizing when you have an opportunity and taking it that, mm -hmm. you know, people perceive as luck. And that's really what what's happened with us is that like we we've we've been very blessed to be in positions to take advantage of some opportunities that have arisen. Um, and so, like, I was blessed and lucky to be studio mates with with my buddy who told me about all this Twitter stuff. And I took advantage of that information to do something for myself, yeah. you know, and, um, and we, we like that idea and it's really cool being able to do that for ourselves and seeing the, the, our employees buying homes and, you know, cars and supporting their family and stuff off of what we're doing. Um, and so we want to continue to grow Salseda as a, um, fulfillment company and help people who are having, who have ideas like what we've got. Uh, grow those things because the hard part is really you know it's it's easy to come up with the idea and come up with the store, but dealing with growing and dealing with all those challenges around getting warehouse space and all that kind of stuff is the hard part. Yeah, and so we we really wanted to make sure that that like we as an organization help people grow their companies. Um, so we're going to continue to do that on the Salceda side, and as far as Texas Humor goes. Um, you know, we want to definitely sort of branch out of just social media and start expanding into some other things. We've talked about doing a, uh, a podcast that we've been developing for a little while, and um, we're probably going to roll that out at some point. Yeah. And, uh, and, and just getting in front of people in different ways other than just social media. So, yeah. Yeah. Some uh, maybe some storefronts and expanding out beyond clothing? Or? Um, I mean, we're, we're expanding the type of clothing. I think that uh, 
without really saying too much, I mean, I, there are some other products that are still in the same kind of vein of what mm-hmm. we do, but just not as simple as just a t-shirt. Yeah. Um, so we've been working on that for a long time and thinking through that stuff. Um, and then, uh, the other part is um, probably, I don't know that we'll open up any storefronts, but I do think that we'll probably have a bigger effort around wholesaling our products to retailers that want to carry it. Yeah. So. Bucky's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we've actually talked to them. Yeah. Um, it just didn't work out timing wise, uh-huh. uh, but we've talked to them about going into their store. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Makes yeah. all the sense yeah, of the world. Totally man. Would. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it, the writing side of it and all the humor the memes the shirts and all that mm-hmm. stuff was it all you to start with at the beginning mm-hmm. or, or do you have more help no i mean at the beginning it was me I, yeah. I basically would just you know come home from work and sit on the couch and write stuff um over time uh i've had some various help you know from interns or whatever eventually we had an intern named allison who worked with us that uh we hired she's our you know marketing coordinator and she runs our store and you know help still to some extent with content. And then we've recently hired somebody else who had been interning with us for a little while named Sydney, who now actually owns pretty much all the content. She generates most of it. Mm. We help contribute to that and stuff, Mm -hmm. but she's really writing a lot of what we post about and stuff. I still get heavily involved in all that. And so a lot of the emails and marketing and stuff like that, that you guys receive, that's all, you know, coming, we have weekly meetings. We talk through all this stuff. We run it like a regular company. Um, but yeah, it's, there's a lot of collaboration. I mean, we're, we all sit out in the same office and we're all talking to each other all week. So when something comes up and, you know, Willie Nelson did this or whatever, like we're all in the same room <laughs> talking about it. Yeah. So even though it's like one person owning the work and writing, you know, the tweets or whatever, we're all, we all have a hand in it still, yeah. you know? So, yeah, that's pretty cool, man. Yeah. Um, so what's been the most, um, the most fun design or the, the ones received the most kind of, Hmm. You know, the I most think response, I guess. You know, I think that um I think that the the Don't California my Texas one has mm-hmm. been pretty uh, you know uh not divisive, but I would say that like every time we post it on on most polarizing. Yeah, there's somebody who's going to complain about it or just or whatever. So it's just that that's the one that's gotten a rise out of people, but I wouldn't say that there's one in particular more so than others. I think that um, for the most part, when people reach out to us, is to just tell us that they think the pro- the quality of the products is great or something like that. Good man, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So, don't California, my Texas. Let's touch let's touch on that a little bit. Yeah. So, what? Uh, you're in Austin. Yeah. A lot of folks from California flooding in the last yeah. five ten years. Yeah. Is it good or bad? You know, I so I, I'm. This may not be the answer that everybody wants to hear, but I don't really care where people come from to move to Texas. I like the idea that people move here. Period. My my idea behind that concept that t-shirt came from the dodgers and astros series last year it was really us just like making fun of the dodgers and just being like you know ghost rose you know ghost rose but it was um so it was born out of that the whole concept and the saying of like don't california my texas has you could really apply to anything i mean it's more about the idea that we we like this the fact that this is a melting pot state you know, mm-hmm. you got German, Czech, French, you know, Mexican, you know, uh, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, you know, I mean, Houston is the most diverse city in the country Yes, by stats, not just like BS. It is the most diverse uh, city in the country. And that's an awesome thing. And but what is cool is that Houston is still like uniquely Houston. And for me, I, I'm more about like don't California my Texas in the same way that I don't want us to Texas their New York or us to Texas Chicago. You know, I want Chicago to be Chicago. I want New York to be New York, you know, Miami to be Miami for Oklahoma to just continue to suck and for like (laughs) Texas to be Texas, you know? And so, uh, that's, what's like, it's just funny to me when people want to move somewhere, whether it's here or Louisiana, but when you want to move somewhere and then just make it like the place that you used to live. That you just left from. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, I'm all about different mindsets. I don't care if you're liberal or whatever. I, it's probably the most annoying thing in the world when people are like, oh, liberal Austin, this or that. I'm just like, who? why does everything have to be politics? Yeah. You know, who cares what anybody believes? We're all Texan. If you moved here, it's probably because we got a killer economy. It's one of the most beautiful places in the country. It's, you know, there's so many things to do. Like, 
you know, do you know how many states would love to have the problem that we have where they're like people moving there constantly? Yeah. You could probably call up anybody in Michigan and they would say, I wish that we had too many people moving here because that's yeah. a sign of a really killer economy. Sure is. And so, you know, I take it as a compliment that people want to move here. Um, yeah, it's annoying when someone moves here and says, you know, well, in California or in Oregon or in, you know, Wyoming, this is how we do it. I'm like, well, great, go back there. That's awesome. <laughs> um, but in Texas, uh, it's more about like, I think it's a net positive that we have, you know, when I started this business, there were like 25 million people living in Texas, I think. Now we're at like 33. Um, I mean, that, that, that is a sign that what we're doing here is, is a good thing, you know? And, and I'm always, I always think that the best ideas come from more people giving input. And yeah. so, um, so, you know, just because we've been doing things a certain way, doesn't mean it's the best, but, uh, but let's work on doing the, whatever is the best thing for Texas. And f- to me, I think that the culture that we've had of, this melting pot of Mexican and German and, you know, like the, you know, Asian influence in Houston, all that is just a really cool thing. And, uh, so, you know, come from California all you want, but don't, you know, don't ruin chili for me or don't, you know, like that kind of stuff. (laughs) Don't put beans in my chili. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's my, my spiel on it is just, um, you know, let let Texas be Texas. I agree with you on a, on a, on a lot of that. Um, the, because so the, for the most part, when when people say you know California is moving to Texas, a lot of those people are bringing business with them. Oh yeah, and that's never a bad thing. The Chivery, the Chive dot com mm-hmm. was in California. They were in I think Long Beach. Yeah, and they moved here because taxes were crazy in California, and so everybody could move to Austin and get an immediate raise without ever having to pay anybody anymore because suddenly they just were keeping more of their money. Correct, and so. Um, so yeah, the Chiveries here, um, you know, there are all these businesses that are moving here because it's just, it is a great place to live. There are so many things to do. It is, uh, a very, very pro business state. The governor has done a fantastic job of really setting the stage for businesses to do well. Um, which I think is awesome. And, uh, yeah. And you, and whatever your flavor is, you've got it somewhere, yeah, you know, absolutely. you can, uh, you can move anywhere in the state and kind of get your feel, which yeah. I dig. I saw something, um, I don't, it was about a year ago, I guess mm-hmm. y'all posted, it was a letter that someone had written in about the, um, you're going to have to help me The born in, born in Tejas shirts, the, Oh yeah. Echo and Tejas. There you go. Like yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this woman wrote in and she, she basically said, um, you know, she was, she was asking about the size of our shirts, which we carry, you know, she was asking for three XL and I was like, well, we do actually have three XL. And so I was, I was telling her that. And, um, but the second part of her email just said that our website felt very Tex-Mex and she said, how about this for an idea, uh, learn English or go home. And so uh, that just struck me as odd because, um, for one, uh, it seems like she's picking on one particular group, you know, she's probably talking about Mexicans. And so that's, you know, uh, bothersome to me as a Tejano and, um, and someone whose family has been here. My mom's side of the family has been in the Corpus area, uh, originated from the Corpus area, um, in the early 1800s. Yeah. And so, and then my, you know, um, so I'm, I'm fifth generation and been here longer than a lot of people, um, and some other groups of people. Um, but that's cool. Whatever. Like there's not a race to see who got here first. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was silly for her to kind of call out Spanish in particular, because I thought when I was a photographer, I I worked on this project, um, where I traveled around the state a bunch and in several instances, I met people who English was not their first language, but Spanish was not their language either. It was German, uh, Czech, you know, all these, like there was this gentleman over in Fredericksburg that I met and he actually flunked first grade twice because he was born around World War II and his first language was German. And mm-hmm. there were a lot of Germans in Fredericksburg. Yep. And his first language was German, but because we were fighting the Germans in World War II, there started to be a lot of backlash towards German people. Yep. And so his parents or the teachers refused to speak to him in German because they didn't want to be seen as like Nazi sympathizers. So this kid who only spoke English or only spoke German 
had to flunk first grade twice because they refused to speak to him in like his native tongue. He didn't know any different. And eventually he learned English, but he still spoke German. Yeah. You know, I mean, he, when I was there at his house, he had two people from Frankfurt visiting him and they were all speaking German with one another. And it was a beautiful, cool thing. Yeah. You know, this is happening right outside Fredericksburg. Yeah. And so anyway, I, I basically just wrote her back and I said, uh, you know, I really appreciate you reaching out. Um, I just, if you're going to tell everybody to go home, just bear in mind that there are a lot of people who speak other languages other than just Spanish, which you seem to be kind of picking on. Yeah. And I told her, be aware that there are plenty of people uh, around the West Texas and like kind of I-10 corridor uh, of Central Texas that still speaks uh, Czech. There are a lot of people who speak German who are in Central Texas, people who speak French in East Texas that are all related to all the French Canadians uh, that eventually came down and became the Cajuns. Yeah, you know, country. Yep. Yeah. So yep. that was that was just frustrating uh, for me to for her to reach out you know she's she it is her right to believe what she believes but um you know everybody in this country with the exception of the native americans are immigrants and so uh jim uh, davy crockett and sam houston were not born in the state of texas <laughs> so if we're going to turn everybody away who's not born here then you're basically trashing the founders of this country of, of this uh state you can say um, country or and country yeah um and if you're going to trash davy crockett and sam houston then you've got beef with me and yeah. so that's uh, that was the direct line I drew is just, you know, I, I just think it's silly to have that mentality. Um, yeah, it, I agree, you know. I agree man. I, I enjoyed it. Um, I saw, I saw your response. You did, you put it very well. Um, did she reply back to that? By she any never chance? did. Yeah, no, I, she never I, did. And, I wouldn't um, imagine she would. There wasn't much she could say. No, and you know, it. Uh, the response I got to it was great. It was, um, you know, I didn't do it for that reason. I, I more so put it out there to kind of like draw a line in the sand and just say, hey, this is what we believe as a company. Yeah, we're, you know, we're not. We're not out here trying to like protest this or that. We're and we're not a political organization. We. Um, we think that all politicians, to some extent, are full of crap. So we uh, <laughs> we tend to stay out of it. Um, but uh, we are we do believe that um, that it's silly to kind of be about this sort of nativism, you know, garbage. We yeah. we like calling it out. Like if someone's a native Texan and they want to wear a t shirt that says that, great. But we're not yeah. going to judge you because you moved here from Wisconsin. You know. Yeah. No, so. I agree, man. It's um, like you said, it's silly. It's it's an old way of thinking. Yeah. That. Well, and shoot, I mean, if we're going to start turning people away, we're going to miss out on a lot of things. Like, let's exactly. just assume that you take anything out, right? Like, let's pull the Germans out. Let's say that we 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 told the Germans they're not allowed to come here. There are a heck of a lot of things in this state that are a byproduct of us having this amazing population of German people. Look at the head I'm wearing. Yeah, exactly. Shiner. No you more Shinerbach beer. There'd be no Shinerbach beer. There'd be no uh, Oktoberfest in Fredericksburg. There'd be no Fredericksburg. Yeah. There'd be no Tejano music because Tejano music is an amalgamation of Mexican music and German music. I mean, there are all these things that are byproducts of the melting pot nature of the state. Yeah. And um, to take any one of them away is just silly, you know, and, and it, it, it cuts at the core of, of what Texas is. I agree, hundred percent, man, hundred percent. Well, very well put, by the way. Yeah, very thanks. Well put. Yeah. Um, as far as has there been, I seen every now and then I'll see another, uh, and y'all y'all post it out there, but another state kind of, you know, not the actual state itself, but another uh, website trying to come up with these little memes or, or say, you know, like uh, ain't Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or oh, yeah, come up yeah, with yeah. different things. Yeah. Um, you know, for their own brand for that state and it, and you kind of put it up there and just kind of chuckle every now yeah, and then. Yeah, I mean, people, you know, I think everybody's got their state pride. I'm, I mean, I'm wearing a shirt called uh, from a brand called Homage uh that's based out of Ohio yeah. and uh I think they're out of Cincinnati. And um excuse me. Um they uh their whole thing is like Midwesterner kind of basketball like pride. And I mean, they're, they sell this retro Astros T-shirt that I bought, and uh, I love it. And uh, they're but Ho- you know, Hoosiers companies, yeah, yeah. They're, they're basically Hoosier companies. Yeah. And um, but you know, that's their thing. It's like their their pride or whatever. So I I think it's funny when people try to like rip off the ain't Texas thing. Yeah. Um, but I also dig that when people are like proud of where they're from. I think yeah, that's absolutely. a cool thing, you know. Absolutely. But it is funny when they they see that concept. I'm like, it doesn't. Like the reason that joke works is because we're so cocky. Like that's the whole point of it is that like we view the lens through the state of Texas. Yeah, you know, um, and so it, it just yeah, it's funny. So I've got a buddy of mine who um, I work with currently, but he's 
was an army ranger for years and then he's real into surfing and he does he kind of travels all over but he spent some time in um in hawaii mm-hmm. and he compares texas he's originally from florida he mm-hmm. compares texas to hawaii and i can see that in the sense of pride and oh, you know yeah. this is the, you know this is our home and this and that he says but texas is worse <laughs> yeah no i mean i i totally see that. i have a buddy yeah. uh, my buddy um pete is from hawaii and that dude is like so Hawaiian. Yeah. I mean, he's like, he's very Texan now too, because he's lived here for a long time, but he came here to go to UT and, you know, some of the stories that I've heard about him from, that he's told us from, about what his experience was like when he first moved here. I mean, it's not all that dissimilar to what it's like for any of us when we go live somewhere else and we're like, wait, this is, this is how you guys, people, you know, y'all yeah. live, this is how y'all treat one another or whatever. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've heard the same thing that Hawaii is very much a uh, very proud state of yeah. being Hawaiian. And, you know, I mean, they've got a lot of native people who, you know, are from that from Hawaii and uh, the culture and stuff is kind of based around, you know, I think the people from there. And yeah, stuff. absolutely. So I, yeah, it's cool. Absolutely. Um, so around the state, where's your favorite spots to hit up? Obviously, live in Austin, grew yeah. up in La Port. Yeah. How was, how was La Port growing up? I love Laporte. I still I still love Laporte. Um, I uh, I miss it. I my parents live there. My brother lives in League City, um, and uh, you know so he's he's close by. My sister lives out in um, Friendswood, and I've got another uh, sister up in uh, I think she's in the Woodlands area. But anyway, I uh, yeah I love Laporte. I thought this is, the people there are amazing, um, friendliest people you'll ever meet, and hardworking group of people. Uh, there's a lot of work there because of all the chemical plants and mm-hmm. refineries and stuff. Um, and so it doesn't really matter what your background is. Like there's something great. You can make a good living for yourself. And, um, but yeah, I, I always loved the, the schools. Um, I had a great experience growing up in the schools. There was a lot to do. It was nice being close to the uh, Gulf coast. And so I, I got to spend time, um, me and my buddy, Jonathan used to go fishing quite a bit on the boat in the mornings before school and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so that was cool. You're right there but, in, um, uh, West Bay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it was great, but it, uh, you know, moved up here to go to UT and then um, stuck around. Just really like Austin, mm-hmm. uh, and then just given the type of work I was in with photography, it was e- it was nice to be here because it was easy to get around the state. Yeah. So um, that was in large part why I stuck around. But uh, favorite part of, st- of the state, if I could spend half the year in the Alpine area, I'd I'd do it. I love Big Bend. And I love that part of the state. Um, you know, I think that the the people out there are just really nice. And uh, and there's something about it, too, that I think it's just, like, hard to get to. Mm-hmm. And so there's, like, this filtering process of, like, oh, it's just so far that, like, there's a special type of person or a special breed of Texan that, like, goes out there. Yeah. And I like those people. So, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I don't – there's nothing specific that I could say. It's, like, oh, this type goes there because they're all across the board. But something about, like – Got to have that extra gear. Yeah, well, you know, and it's it's something about just the mentality. It's like yeah. if, if you think that going in the middle of the dry desert is a great place to go relax, I probably like you. <laughs> and so I don't know. I, there's there's something about Alpine that I just really really like. So I spend time out there, um, and then I love going to Terlingua and uh, and specifically Big Bend. Yeah. Um. So I'm actually headed out to Terlingua for the big chili cook off in uh, the first weekend in November. Awesome. So, yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah. So where's your favorite spots around Austin to hit up that if somebody was coming in to visit, you'd be um, like, oh, you got hit X, Y, Z. I would say, you know, um, the Broken Spokes, you know, kind of one of the big the big things you got to do. It's one of the tourist spots, but it's also just a great, like, kind of local spot. Um, and it's just a honky-tonk where you can go hear great live music. Um, Barton Springs is obviously also a, a fantastic pool. Um you know, I really like the Fredericksburg area. That, mm-hmm. I mean, I, th- I think a lot of people do. Uh, Wimberley's beautiful. I've never had an opportunity to go to this, but I have, my neighbors have gone a bunch, and I've seen people go quite a bit. But a, a, supposedly, excuse me, the um, the Fourth of July rodeo in Wimberley is a lot of fun. It's like a small town rodeo, mm-hmm. and, um, and the photos I've always seen from it look awesome. And um, so, if you like rodeo and you like small town stuff, Wimber- Wimberley is supposedly a great place to go. Um, I've been to Wimberley a bunch, but I've never been to the rodeo itself. Yeah, I didn't, I've never heard of that yeah. either. My wife is from small town Texas, uh, Clarendon, Texas, up near Amarillo. 
Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're okay. um, if you're heading to Amarillo on 283 from mm-hmm. Dallas, that's about an hour east of Amarillo, mm-hmm. this town, Clarendon, Texas, and they have a Fourth of July rodeo every year. That's a cool. big rodeo, big, big parade, all that stuff. Yeah. About two thousand people in the town mm-hmm. um, that live there. But for that Fourth of July weekend, everybody that's since like moved off all kind of come back. So there's yeah. probably about you know. 5,000 people there when, when all those festivities well, go on. That's sort of the deal with Terlingua. I mean, I, like, I'm sure the I think when the cook-off's not going on, the the population in Terlingua is probably like 100 people or something. And then when <laughs> the cook-off, there are two cook-offs out there at the same time, and when those go, there's probably 30,000 people around. Yeah. yeah. And they're all camping in RVs and stuff. But Are yeah. you part of any team for a cook-off, or you just go enjoy it? No, so uh, so competition chili is not a team thing. It's an individual cook okay. thing. And, um and uh, so, I so basically the story goes that about fifty two years ago, um, this guy from from New York wrote an article that said that he you know didn't think that Texans knew anything about chili or whatever, and that he could make a better pot. And so uh, I believe it was Frank Tolbert. Um, he was a writer. Frank X Tolbert was a uh, a writer. I think at the Dallas Morning News. And so he wrote a, a response piece kind of calling him out. And so they committed to having a cook-off together in which they would compete against one another with, you know, a judge to just decide, you know, um, who was better. And effectively what happened was uh, – so they – some somehow or another they knew Carroll Shelby, the famous race yeah, car driver. Yep. And Carroll Shelby used to own pretty much all the land out there in Terlingua around the ghost town. And so he said, why don't we go out there and do it? And so they went out to his, you know, to the general store that's in Terlingua, and they had a chili cook-off. And there were three judges. One judge picked Frank's chili. The other judge picked, you know, the other guys. And uh, and then the third judge supposedly burned his tongue and couldn't taste the difference. And so there was it was named a draw. Um, and so, anyway, long story short, the, the, I'm I'm sure I'm messing up some of the details slightly, but nonetheless, uh, that was how the cook-off started and the whole idea behind championship chili cook-off. Mm-hmm. Um, eventually, it developed into people going out there every year, so this became a thing they did every year. Uh, subsequently, there were some schisms in which, like, the organization kind of broke up, and now there's, like, a chili cook-off out in Las Vegas, There's a, and then the two main ones that are still in existence in Terlingua happen there. Uh, on the first weekend in November every year. And basically, you just qualify by cooking in one of these other cook-offs. There's there the two organizations that sanction them. One is called a Tolbert sanction or Tolbert organization, and the other is CASI, C-S-I, and, or C-A-S-I. And you have to do a couple, you know, cook-offs, and if you get first place in any of them, you automatically qualify to cook out there for the championship. Otherwise, you get enough points, and then you qualify mm-hmm. uh, through winning or placing uh, yeah. throughout the year. So it's a lot like barbecue, mm-hmm. you know, and that kind of deal, but it's always an individual person. It's not a team sport. And um, you don't have to compete to go out there. Uh, you can just go out there and hang out, which is what kind of drove me out there. Um, I actually judge on the finals table for the for the one out in Trilingua, but... Uh, but a lot of times, even if you go to the local ones, you can get on a judging table pretty easily. Hmm. So, yeah, they're, it's pretty fun. Dude, that is an awesome story. Yeah. It's, Carol, uh, yeah you threw Carol Shelby in there. You yeah. Got, no, you got he, uh, punch, I'm like, my, my Texas vibes are, are humming yeah, right now. No, Carol Shelby owned that property for a long time. He eventually yeah. got rid of it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I um, before he passed... I'm, I, I can't confirm it, but I'm almost positive I passed him on the on on I-10 at one point. I saw somebody driving a, a Shelby Cobra, um, and you know, out in that part of the country, there aren't a lot of people just driving with the Shelby Cobra, yeah. you know, around I-10. And so I'm I'm pretty confident that it was him that was on the highway. I didn't get a good look at him specifically, but uh, but that was 10, 15 years ago, something like that. Yeah, so. another Texas legend, man. Yeah, the car culture in this in this state is um, I think underrated. Yeah. I think yeah, it's big car underrated. culture. Yeah, big time. Uh, yeah, I loved in uh, when Anthony Bourdain did his episode on Houston. Uh, <laughs> you know, Bun B or not uh, Slim Thug. Yeah, or no, was it Bun B? It's Bun B. Yeah, Bun B yeah. was taking him around, and uh, and was sh- they were just kind of like showing off the low ri- not low riders, but just like the all the different cars. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So no, I, I'm with you. I think it's a different form than most other states because it's more truck driven and things like that but it's yeah. uh but yeah it's um it's cool if you've never seen um i'm just telling the general audience this now yeah. if you've never seen on amazon prime there's a 
documentary called Ford versus Ferrari and don't know what Carol Shelby did to American racing, mm-hmm. go watch that documentary. Oh, absolutely. It is absolutely amazing, man. I'm I'm dialed into that. I've watched it like three times. You know, it's kind of what's interesting to me about the fact that F1 has not taken off more in the United States. Uh, I'm not like a big F1 guy, but mm-hmm. you know, we have, tr- we have a track here, yeah. Circuit of the Americas, that a lot of people say is one of the best in the world. Um, and uh, and so it's, it's always been interesting to me given – how high performance all those vehicles are, you know, even r- relative to like NASCAR and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of that's driven by, you know, European racing and just the nature of racing a car in Europe is just completely different than what we do here. Correct. But uh, yeah, it's always been kind of a surprise to me that just given how much Texans and Americans love cars, that, you know, NASCAR has always just kind of played the bigger role in, in sort of people's interest. But I think it's, well, I think that's starting to change a little bit now that. Not that NASCAR is going away, but I, th- I do think that it seems like F one's picking up a little bit more interest than it used to. Well, it helps that we have a track here now, yeah, right? Yeah. It helps that we have a track for sure. Um, but you know, the main the main thing about that is NASCAR started as an American thing, right? Yeah, uh, it's a homegrown deal. Exactly yeah. the the moon the the moonshine the runs in the, yeah. in the hills of Tennessee, right? Um, yeah, kind of started that whole you know th- that whole car culture and yeah. drag racing on the beaches of um, Florida and. California right. and all that stuff, so th- you know that's if if you're asking the reason why, that's the reason why. No, that and that makes sense, but uh, you know it's like it's always just surprised me that it has not to not to say that NASCAR shouldn't be as big as it is, but more so that that there hasn't just been more all, like you know interest in F1 as well, yeah. you know, because it's just another version of racing. But you know, again, I think Look, it's, it, it's just the American bred version versus yeah. the European. But uh yeah, when those when that's all taken off in Austin, it's pretty interesting because you'll start seeing all the like huge planes flying in with the cars. You mm-hmm. know, you'll see all these big seven forty sevens and stuff yeah. flying, and they've got all those F one cars on them, and they're bringing them in. You know, from across the world. I had a buddy of mine that um, he lived here for about four or five years, and he worked at the Cabela's mm-hmm. in Buda, you mm-hmm. know, south south yeah. here, and just right down the road. Actually, we're in South Austin, but um, he said that when they had their first big event. Mm-hmm. And all of these, you know, European and, you know, mm-hmm. throughout the world, people came in. They all, not all, but a lot of them came to that Cabela's and tried to buy guns. Oh, and I'm was, sure. And, yeah. <laughs> and we're yeah. like, we, you know, it's America. I want yeah. a gun, you know. Yeah. And they're like, we can't sell you a gun, but <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't work that way, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> but they're all, you know, Ferrari jackets. We can sell and, guns to almost anybody, but, yeah, yeah. unfortunately it doesn't work. Exactly. It's not quite that easy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it, it you know it's it's interesting when that ha- when F one's going on because there's I mean obviously it's like a very very like popular it's, it's, it's sort of like event. it's like soccer yeah you know it's correct. like we don't think it's that big of a deal but like it's a global event exactly and so um, the city of Austin really just kind of explodes when that's going on uh, to the point where like traffic out there is pretty hectic because it's out kind of in the middle of nowhere and uh, so the, they'll. They'll open up like helicopter taxi services. Wow! Where you'll like park your car over on the west side of town, and then fly you from the west side of town over all the traffic, and then like wow. land you at you know. So how much does that cost? Uh, shoot, more than I have. Yeah. So, uh, but it's you know it's just that's kind of the level of stuff that happens. You know, yeah. I mean it's kind of nuts. Dude, there's but, a lot of money in that race. Oh yeah, no, I, I, you know I got to go out there. Maybe like almost a year ago, um, there was a little. There's a company that is based in San Marcos that has all these supercars, and um, once a year they'll rent out the Circuit of Americas, and you can go out and drive one of these supercars. You know, they'll have like a McLaren and like whatever, and you can just hop in and drive it a couple laps. And uh, you sign here. Yeah, and they well, and then they stick a guy over in your right seat to tell you how to drive. You know, because like. You're gonna like only push a car so far, but he's telling you like, okay, turn, 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 add more gas, more gas, more gas. Okay, let off, or you know, tap the brake to set your wheels, and then like now you can turn hard. And all the like strategy of how to yeah. drive a car the right way, not like that type of vehicle yeah. the right way. Um, they're piping it in over your ear, so you're driving and pushing, and you're like, shit, I'm gonna spin out. And he's like, no, 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 keep going, keep going, keep going. And so you, I, I got up to like 100, and, you know, 20 something miles an hour in this Audi that I was driving, and. Uh, yeah, driving that track was awesome. It was yeah. super fun. That's on that's on the bucket list for yeah. sure. Yeah, um, I think it's, I think the company's called uh, it's like Longhorn Racing or something like that. But they're based in St. Marcus. They've got their own track, mm-hmm. but it's from what I've heard, it's like not as good. It's just I mean, like it's fun, but you can really push a car out here because that's like a nice track that's like clean. Yeah. You know, are so. you familiar with uh, John Hennessy? Not so much so, like Hennessy Racing. Yes. Yeah. I passed his place because he's over here off of I ten and or off Katie, Yeah, right yeah. outside Katie off I ten. Yeah. So he's in the 
in the middle of building a supercar huh. that's supposed to smash all the records. Gotcha. He's got like a $1.6 million motor that's cranking out something mm-hmm. along the lines of like, I don't want to... I don't want to. Lie. I want to say it's fifteen hundred horsepower, but it could be like twenty six. I can't remember yeah. exactly, but it's some monstrosity twin turbo. Interesting. It's huge, like seven point two liter hmm. engineering marvel. Mm-hmm. And he's um, he's in the he's so he's built the motor, and he's got twenty six of them coming out. And like I said, they're one point two mm-hmm. million dollars a piece. These mm-hmm. motors, and I think he's taking the money from selling those motors to like. 14 of the 26 already sold or something like that. Mm-hmm. And he's taking the money from that to finish out the rest of the car. He's building the car out around that motor. That motor. Designing. And it's supposed to be just some crazy. Hmm. Yeah, I'll go look at that. Yeah. yeah. John Hennessy's doing some. Doing, that's that's my that's my kind of point is that Texas is an underrated car place, man. Mm-hmm. Like, um, you know, that guy's got that huge shop where he's turning out. You know, you can send just buy, go buy a Mustang GT, mm-hmm. send it over to him with $30,000 and you got a 800 horsepower freaking Mustang with, mm-hmm. you know, all their stuff on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've got the gas monkey guys on mm-hmm. that. Everybody knows on mm-hmm. in Dallas, um, Carol Shelby, obviously, you know, a bunch mm-hmm. of NASCAR drivers. So the, the, the car culture in, in Jesse James moved to Austin when mm-hmm. five years ago. Right. Yeah. And he's still, he actually just moved his shop over, I think it's over on the East side now. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you used to see him around town uh, uh, quite a bit I, I haven't seen him in a while I don't yeah. know if he still lives here or not but yeah yeah no, there's no there's for sure a lot of that um but it uh yeah you know I I don't know it's um it's interesting because you know for as much as you have to drive in this state it uh <laughs> you would think that it would get a little more credit for how much we like our yeah. vehicles but yeah no I'm with you on that yeah yeah 10 four so what else are you into man um what do you what do you do for fun around this um, camp? When I had the time, I flew planes. I, I'm a, a private pilot, so I'd do that, you know, here and there. Uh, haven't had quite as much time to do that recently, just with as busy as the business has been and all that. But uh, but that's been a, a a fun kind of you know hobby that I've had for some years. Um, and then uh, yeah, outside of that, man, just kind of hanging out at the hanging out in South Austin and spending time, um, you know, in, in this part of town has has been a lot of fun for us. And uh, travel around quite a bit. To, we got a motorhome last year or a, a travel trailer last year, so we try to travel the state, go down to the mm-hmm. Gulf Coast and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, overall, man, uh, we we've been really lucky. We've got 57 people that work for us, so we spend a lot of time working and just growing our business. That's yeah. the thing that I enjoy doing most is really just working on that so no, not a yeah. bad thing man yeah i was gonna ask about your your planes uh i hadn't seen you post so you used to post pictures of like mm-hmm. flying back and forth to houston yeah um but i hadn't seen you post that in a while so yeah i haven't i mean it was my brother-in-law's plane so i flew his quite mm-hmm. a bit and uh but i um i just haven't i hadn't had the time to yeah. be honest and so uh the business was a little smaller back then so i had more time to just kind of yeah. duck out on a monday and go cruise around uh, but I haven't had an opportunity to do that in quite a while, so it's been um, kind of a bummer. But the one cool thing that is coming up is that um, I I did a project. Uh, if you follow my personal Instagram account, which is just J-A-Y-B uh, Sauceda, S-A-U-C-E-D-A, um, I've got a lot of aerial photos that I've shot over the years. Um, but one kind of project in particular was uh, one in which I flew around the whole perimeter of the state and photographed it from the air. Wow. So it took about six days, um, 36 total hours of flight time. But I flew the whole perimeter, photographed it um, from various altitudes, and then um, it, it's. I've got a book coming out on October second, and then I've got a. Um, I've got the book, and then I've got a an exhibit at the Bob Bullock State History Museum, which is the main museum that the the state of Texas owns, um, and is all about just the history of Texas and all that. And yeah. there'll be an exhibit there for about five months starting in January of, uh, 2019. That's so it'll awesome, run through man. June. Um, yeah, it'll, I think it opens like January 26th or 27th, something like that. I'm going to have to come check that out. For yeah. Real. So it'll be, uh, it's gonna be cool. There, there'll be a lot of my photo- photographs in there and, uh, there'll be some exhibits on really just like flying and learning to fly and some stuff like that. It'll be yeah. pretty neat. Yeah. So is the is the book coming out? Is it like the picture and here's what we're looking at? And like no, little... well, sort of. I mean, basically, you know, it's uh, 
It's broken into a couple of different sections. It's broken into the basically the way that the trip took place, which was in a series of legs, you know, where I'd kind of like f- take off in the morning, fly until I got to whatever destination and stop and then go to sleep and wake up and do the next. And so it's broken out that way. The images are just in there. And then there's like a caption on the same page or the next page telling you like where that is or yeah. what it is, you know, and that's pretty much it. That's cool, so, man. Yeah. But it's it's cool. It's like 200 pages. Yeah. Um, it's a really big formatted book. Um, it'll be a really, really nice gift or uh, coffee table book. And yeah. it's kind of just a, you know, in a lot of ways, like a visual love letter to Texas. Uh, you know, it's... Um, it, it, it was a really fun, cool thing to get to do. I did that for Texas Monthly about, shot it about three years ago. And uh, it ran as a cover story um, when it when it did. And, um, well, or I shot it three years ago. It published last May um, of 2017. Mm. And uh, it ran as a cover story at that point. And then, um, but yeah, since then, now I've got this book uh, that UT Press published for me. And, uh, and then the exhibit, yeah, like I said, is, is January. Awesome, man. Is there any, is there any thoughts to, uh, making like a poster with the outline of Texas, you know, with mm, actual like, pictures? Well, oh, uh, nothing like that. I am building out a, a store where you can buy prints. Yeah. So, cause I mean, there's like 44,000 pictures. Wow. You know? I mean, I'm not going to put all of them on there, but there are a lot of images that, yeah. uh, and they're all, you know, cool in their own way. I've got stuff up in the panhandle that's really beautiful. I've got... Images of Guadalupe Peak um, or Guadalupe Mountains. Um, I've got really awesome photos of like you know Surfside and uh, the Rio Grande Valley and just kind of all over the place. So, yeah, yeah, that's awesome deal, man. I didn't know about that. I'm gonna yeah. check that out. Yeah. Um, so when uh, when you're back in Houston, mm-hmm. do you catch many Astros games? I mean, are you? Are you I don't get over there as much as I'd like uh, to be able to make it to a game. I got to go to the World Series last year, the first game that we had back in mm-hmm. Houston. Um, so that was awesome because we crushed the uh, Dodgers in that game. Um, and then I, I think the game after that was when we got beat there in Houston. Well, um, I think it was game f- – well, yeah, you're right. You're yeah, right, I think game right. five yeah. was game the f- first one back, right, wasn't it? Yeah, it was or, one, two here, three, four there, and then five, five here, six there, seven – here. Yeah, something like that. Or no, there something were two. Like there it. were two yeah, in Houston, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so the first one was the one that we went to, and we destroyed them. And then the second game, I think they beat us pretty bad. Yeah. And then there was maybe a third. I'm trying one to remember because I had a buddy of mine that went yeah. to the one where they got destroyed, and I thought it was but, game uh, game game. It wasn't game five. Game five was the one where we don't went off and hit home runs and jacks, and it yeah. was, that was one of the, like the best baseball games ever played. Yeah, that so that was one yeah. that we were at. Okay, and, um, that yeah, that was one that we were at, and. Uh, yeah, but I grew up going to the Astrodome, so yeah. like I, you know, I really didn't know. By the time I was older, uh, you know, Minute Maid Park had been built out and all that, and um, it was Enron Field when I was a kid. <laughs> but it, uh, yeah, you know, we we grew up going to the Astrodome and uh, watching the games there, and uh, and it was a lot of fun to to do all that stuff. But since since they moved to the Minute Maid Field, I haven't really had as many opportunities yeah. to get back there and watch. So. Yeah, man. Um, do, you, do you do uh, UT games at all? Um, not a ton. I mean, I, I did a ton in college. Yeah. Um, I was there in 2005. Uh, well, I guess it was 2006, technically, uh, in California when we beat USC. Mm. Um, so I was in the end zone, the opposite end zone of where Vince Young ran into. But uh, I got to go to that game, um, which was super cool. And uh, definitely, but still, I think, is one of the best games of football that anyone has had an opportunity to watch. Um, They're but, still uh, doing documentaries and yeah sports you know and things the 30 about 30 it. Yep. on all that yep. stuff has yep. been super cool to see and um so yeah that was really that was a neat experience mm-hmm. i mean I, I i'm super thankful to my parents to be able to you know get me the ticket to fly I, I bought the the actual ticket to the game but i um and and got it for face value which is even better uh but uh my parents you know bought me a flight to get out there and and my dad put himself through college and never had had an opportunity to go to a football game when he was in school at ut and so he called me up and he was like, whatever you can do, go to that game. Like, we will make it happen for you. And, and That's so awesome. That was super sweet of them, and, and it's still easily one of my favorite memories of school. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't go quite as often anymore. I used to go to a lot of the baseball games. Um, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's like – I think if I lived in Houston, I'd make an effort to come over here and see football games. But because I live here, I'm like, oh, I'll go next year or whatever. So we watch all the games at home um, or I'll go to the bar and and watch it with some friends. But, um, 
you know, I've been to a couple since getting out of college, but that, yeah. not not a ton. I have several friends that um, graduated from UT and they have season tickets. Mm-hmm. They're up every weekend, mm-hmm. coming up, hanging out. And, and you know, we almost them. bought them this year actually, yeah. um, as a company. And uh, I was supposed to go down there and look at the seats and see if they were the right fit. And I got busy, had to reschedule the meeting, and just never picked back up with the sales guy. And so next thing I know, I was like, "Oh shoot, there's a game Saturday." Yeah. It's like, well, if we're gonna go to a game, I'm gonna just I'll buy a ticket. And yeah. Go. So. Yeah, ten four. Yeah. Um, favorite eats around the can- around here. Um, I really like Polvo's, good Mexican food on South First. Uh, Casa Garcia is a really good uh, Mexican food restaurant around the corner from our house. Um, for brisket and, and barbecue, my favorite place was this place called Ruby's, which was up off of 29th, uh, just north of campus. I'd been going there for a long time, but that just closed. Mm. Excuse me. And, um, so we, uh, I used to go there quite a bit. Um, but there's a lot of good barbecue. I don't think any barbecue is bad. So I've, I'm pretty, no, there's so open. many around here. It's, yeah. it's crazy, man. But, uh, yeah, I like that place a lot. And then, um, there's a killer taco truck. In front of a, there's a coffee shop called Cosmic that's on South Congress. It's fairly new, like within the last year. And there's a taco truck in front of it called uh, Pueblo Viejo, and that place is easily my favorite tacos in the city. Like they are just freaking amazing. So yeah, yeah I, I try to hit that place up fairly often. Awesome, man. Yeah. Well, we're about four o'clock. I'll okay. let you go ahead and get out of here. But um, yeah, sounds good. I really appreciate you doing this. Yeah, it's of been course. a lot of fun. Yeah. and uh, I'm glad to learn everything about you and what all you got going on. Is there anything coming up with uh, Texas Humor that we need to know about or we need to be looking for for the? Um, we've got our long sleeves coming back soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, that we, people always start asking us about those once we get to the tail end of the year. So long sleeves are definitely coming back. Uh, we've got some new hats and some new other products that are pretty exciting. And uh, and we're gonna be trying to expand into some stuff that's just like not a straight up like uh, shirt or hat or whatever. Like our keychains that we just released have been one of the most popular things we've released in a long time. Yeah. And so that's been super cool to see. So we'll be uh, mixing it up quite a bit. But um, stay, you know, go subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, we try to make them funny and entertaining. So follow us there, and uh, you'll hear about all our sales and things like that that we've got coming down the pipeline. Awesome, man. If there's anybody listening that wants to take advantage of your uh, logistics mm-hmm. uh, that you have going on, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, look up uh, Sauceda Industries. So S-A-U, it's spelled like sauce, uh, and then the letter's D-A, so Sauceda uh, industries.com just google us and um or if you google my name and you know my company it'll come up and uh just shoot us an email we're happy to talk through it good deal man yeah. awesome really appreciate it yeah of course thank you all right thank you guys adios y'all be good